Hello, everyone, and welcome back live from the Oxford University Museum of Natural History for this final session of the Paleontological Association Annual Meeting. My name is Jack Matthews, and it's a pleasure to chair this final session. Just a few very quick reminders. If you have any connection issues at any point, please do use the reconnect button at the top of the page. And should you have any questions for our speakers, please do use the chat. Please do keep questions coming in as you think of them. That way I can gather them all together and put them to the speaker as efficiently as possible at the end. Now we've got um, one final talk from the main scientific session. Then we're going to be hearing from the association's diversity officer before presentations about what's coming up in 2021. But at that point, I think we should hear um, Hedda Agik, who is joining us all the way from the USA. How are you, Hedda? Do you want to turn your camera and microphone on? There Hi, we go. thanks, Jack. What's the weather like where you are? It is sunny. It's lovely. Probably much but It's like that for most of the year. Excellent. Then without further ado, the final talk. Take it away. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking around until the very end. Uh, I'll talk about Precambrian organic world microfossils, which are our prime archive to investigate the evolution of early uh, eukaryotes. There are a lot of unknowns about these fossils, but here we have a new approach by which we can squeeze out paleoecological information. The origin of eukaryotes at the end of Paleoproterozoic, um, seen on this geologic scale with time on x-axis, is one of the major evolutionary transitions in the history of life. So eukaryotes are one of the traditionally three domains of life, and they differ from bacteria and archaea in having a complex cell and a suite, and a suite of organelles performing specific functions. Uh, but although charismatic eukaryotes, like us animals, uh, are big, like this whale at the bottom here, um, there's also a vast diversity of microscopic forms. So this is a busy phylogenetic tree of many eukaryotic groups, but I just want to point out here that most of eukaryotes are single cell protists. And in fact, they remained tiny through most of the proterozoic. We mainly know about the evolutionary history of early complex cells through the record of organic world microfossils. They appear around 1.6 billion years. Um, Multicellular fossils then appear around 1 billion. They undergo radiation in the mid-Tonian period. Um, and then the macroscopic life appears at the Ediacaran Cambrian transition, as we've heard yesterday. Yet there are many questions about this important group and generally paleoecology of this vast time um, that remain unanswered so far. So what are they specifically? Are there taxa that are crown group eukaryotes? Uh, what are their trophic preferences or habitats? Um, a, a big question in eukaryotic evolution is the effect of changing ocean oxygenation in the Proterozoic. So midway through Earth's history, the planet was quite different than today. Oxygen levels are shown here in percent of present day levels on y-axis and time on x-axis from Tim Lyons' compilation proxies. So oxygen remained low for about a billion years until the Neoproterozoic and, uh, and even early Phanerozoic, as we've just heard and shown recently and uh, shown by Rachel yesterday. But tiny eukaryotes do show up in this in this period, um, so so around around this time. Uh, so they originated and diversified in the interval before the second rise in oxygen. And commonly, this lack of oxygen was invoked as a break on um, or a slowdown on the evolution of complex life. And while this is largely true for macroscopic life. Um, the, the fossil record through this time is quite rich in diverse groups of microscopic eukaryotes, and a lot, a lot of that came out in recent years. Uh, it is assumed that they also needed oxygen because they possess mitochondria for aerobic respiration, but not knowing exactly what environments they inhabited or even where in the water column presented a challenge to investigate any hypotheses about uh, early eukaryotic evolution, especially in terms of, uh, in terms of oxygen. Okay, as I said, all eukaryotes today, apart from some weird derived exceptions, have used uh, have mit mitochondria used in respiration and would require oxygen to some extent. But when were those acquired? So the last eukaryotic common ancestor, or, or Leca in blue, uh, probably possessed mitochondria, but there could have been there, there could have been some lineages of early eukaryotes, you know, perhaps members of the, the stem groups that were more adapted to the prevalent anoxic environments at the time. And those would also have entered the fossil record. Um, 
So to some extent, this question of where and how eukaryotes lived can be tested with a fossil record. Uh, so we can look under what conditions our death assemblage was deposited. But this is not straightforward. There are a few scenarios we should consider. Um, so our eukaryotes have inhabited water column with oxic or anoxic bottom water. And in the second one, the fossils that get deposited represent a few things. So in life, these guys could have lived only at the surface or just the depth or everywhere. And so to get more precise information from our anoxic samples, we must distinguish between these somehow. One approach that can tell us more about, about this is to explore what carbon pools influence our fossils. So, for example, we may see uh, environments with a carbon isotope gradient. So those would be cases of, uh, for example, an active biologic pump with phytoplankton producing at the surface. Uh, and or sort of a case with anoxia at depth uh, and thus less mixing. And so this will lead to different isotopic signals in different parts of the water column. We would expect heavier carbon isotope values sort of at the surface due to export of light carbon from surface to depth via photosynthesis. And if there is a lack of circulation or a lot of production, then heavy carbon would be accumulated at the top. In contrast, in a, in a well-mixed ocean, or well circulated ocean, there will be a small gradient. And we can try and assess this for our Precambrian ecosystems by measuring carbon isotopes on single fossils to see if they take up carbon from a, a particular part of the water column or if their values are simply reflecting um, like bulk carbon. So to gain this info about paleoecology of Precambrian eukaryotes, uh, material was collected from the late Tonian Chura group exposed in the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The so Chura spans about 1,600 meters of mostly mud rocks, also sandstones uh, and some dolomites. Its age has been constrained to about 770 to 729 million years. So this is late Tonian uh, before the snowballs. And this place is awesome for Precambrian paleontology because beautifully preserved organic wall microfossils occur throughout the Chuar. And these include quite a few eukaryotic taxa with processes, uh, different patterns, and envelopes. At the top, another microfossil group appears. Um, these are vase-shaped microfossils and likely remains of testate and maybe. Uh, shales and microfossils were deposited at various depth regimes, seen in several regression intervals, and under different redox conditions of the bottom water, oxic or ferruginous, uh, with some eucinia at the top. Um, redox and depth don't appear to affect microfossil preservation or abundance that much in the chuar. Microfossils were extracted from shales using, um, so throughout the chuar succession, uh, using a modified paleontological acid maceration method, uh, to minimize contamination from external carbon sources. And I'm happy to discuss details afterwards. Uh, so this is in the center, um, the acid insoluble re re residue, a mix of organic bulb macrofossils, bits of microbial mat, and then clumps of fluffy keratin. And out of that, individual microfossils are handpicked and placed into these silver cups for analysis. Over 100 microfossils were analyzed with a nano-elemental analyzer, uh, IRMS at Syracuse. Uh, microfossils come from a variety of settings, as I mentioned, so samples representing deep and shallow environments, as well as oxic and ferruginous bottom waters. And only low TOC shales were analyzed, as those were found to yield uh, best microfossil preservation. This is shown in work uh, about to be published by Tina Waltz. And I should note that only thin layers of shale were processed whenever possible, so the time averaging bias is minimized. Oh, and in importantly, the microfossils record primary carbon. Now, out of the chore assemblage, prokaryotes are quite common. There are several, several filamentous and cell aggregate taxa like Rugosopsis and Polytrichoides, and these were generally interpreted as components of benthic microbial mat. So we have an idea where these guys lived, thus they can provide some orientation of what is going on at depth. And they're usually isotopically very light, consistent with what we would expect in a system with isotopic depletion at, at depth. And I'll come back to that in a second. And here are carbon isotopic values of individual organic wall microfossils throughout the Chur group. So height is on the y-axis and delta 13C on the x-axis. Each color represents different taxon of microfossils. Uh, this, is, this is quite busy, but the point for now is that there is quite a lot of variation among them. So each of these lines is a horizon, a macerated sample that contains a bunch of different taxa, and they're showing pretty different isotopic values up to 22 per mil, on average uh, 12 per mil. 
Also know these uh, squares of bulk delta 13 C organic carbon values, per sample. These data were pre previously published by Carol Dale et al. And individual microfossils deviate from that bulk value um, by, by, by quite a lot here, uh, by 15 per mil. So this variation suggests that individual microfossils took up carbon of different values. If we compare a topic value of bulk shale, bulk mass rate, and individual microfossils, uh, the fossils have a very broad range, both heavier and lighter than the bulk. Uh, it could be that some fraction is being lost in maceration here, but this range suggests that microfossils incorporated carbon from, from various, various sources. Um, for, for a lot of taxa, even within, within taxon, there is quite a bit of variation. The broadest range of isotopic values is seen in Leos radia, and this is exactly what we would expect. So Leos radia uh, are, are smooth spheres present throughout Precambrian, and they're likely polyphyletic, meaning that a simple form could represent a variety of species. And this shows us that they likely inhabited different parts of the water column where they you know, could have incorporated carbon of different values, or uh, the death assemblage is recording some short-term temporal change. Um, so some distinct Newtonian eukaryotes, like, uh, like brainy cerebrosphera, or uh, squamosphera, or hairy linolatosphera, have a narrower range within, within taxon. Uh, let's zoom in on a few samples to see what's going on in a single horizon, so a single macerated um, sample where we could, this was a shale lamina, so one of the samples with the broadest range of values is uh, deep water and oxic. Different taxa have different values and they are offset from the bulk. As in the overall chuar, uh, the broadest range is seen in Leosferdia, as we would expect. But in contrast, some well-defined eukaryotic species uh, show similar values. For example, Cerebrosphera, or this common bubbly taxon in Tonian units, uh, Squamosphera, or Lanolithosphera. Okay, so do the ranges of isotopic values differ between samples recording uh, anoxic or oxic bottom waters? Uh, not really. I mean, both seem to show a variety of values, and this could represent short-term change or different carbon sources again. Going back to the question about early eukaryotic ecology, where did they live? Uh, let's take a long, let's take kind of a, a look at a water column cartoon, and, and apologies for my poor artistic skills here. Uh, so we know that mad builders, or these uh, squiggles, live at the bottom. In this example, they're much lighter than a bulk organic carbon, around minus 30 per mil. And in the same sample, uh, eukaryote simia is very enriched, minus 15, minus 14 per mil. So presumably, it incorporated its carbon in enriched surface waters. Um, some other common eukaryotes, like linolithosphera or squamosphera, are also offset from the bulk, but a bit more depleted. And so it is less likely that those would have lived at the surface. This suggests that single-celled eukaryotes could have inhabited different parts of the water column. So not all are enriched. Um, we, we kind of assumed that they were all restricted to oxygen and surface waters. Simia could have been or it could have used some kind of different metabolism. Uh, for a long time, it was suggested to be related to presinified algae due to similarity with their cysts or phycomas, and perhaps its equatorial extension helped reduce its sinking rate to stay in the surface water to have a liquid to synthesize. So considering that, a planktonic mode of life in the upper column is not surprising for, for simia. Uh, some of the main points from these preliminary results are that the microfossils show a broad range of isotopic values that are usually quite offset from the bulk acid insoluble organic carbon. Um, and individual species have different value ranges. Now, this is both exciting uh, and also a bit worrying because it su suggests that perhaps we shouldn't trust the bulk carbonizer value that much, which is showing us just an average of a given water column. Uh, this has been su suspected actually for some time. Classic papers have discussed how isotopic records of uh, bulk organic matter can be difficult to interpret actually. Um, this results from contributions from various sources of organi organic uh, carbon within sediments, which have a heterogeneous comp composition. And the microfossil record um, that, that we've shown here is supporting this. They are quite heterogeneous, which probably reflects their ecology. But I'll finish by saying that this is also encouraging. Uh, we're able to get some information, like the striking distinction between uh, depleted mad builders in depth and enriched microfossils that will long assume planktonic. And hopefully, with more of the studies, the, microfo the microfossils will play um, in you know, important role in helping us understand this environmental variation as well as Precambrian carbon cycle dynamics. So thank you for listening and thanks to NSF for money.
Thank you so much to Hedda for a, a wonderful and fascinating talk. And from my own perspective, it's nice for someone to be going well down in the geological column to some proper rocks. So brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions in the chat? Well, we've got lots of people. We've got Rachel Wood and uh, Little Phil, as he goes by, saying, uh, great talk, great talk. I'm going to ask you, what next? What's what's the next big thing for work, building on this work? Um, so this is only, this is so far data from only one basin. And uh, actually, as this has sort of been shown yesterday, um, a lot of the Precambrian basins are quite unique and different from each other. And so the next step would be to... Um, to move this onto onto different time periods as well as uh, different different basins, and Phoebe Cohen is using this the same approach now on one of the one of the oldest eukaryotic assemblages from the Roper group, which is around 1.4 billion years uh, billion years old, to see what the early eukaryotes have been doing because we're dealing now with something that you know just before the snowball, uh, the, um, pretty pretty late. Excellent. Thank you so much to Hedda. If you have any more questions, do pop them in the chat and I'm sure Hedda will uh, reply through the chat to any more questions you have. But thanks once more to Hedda. At this point, we are going to zoom over to Rachel Warnock, our diversity officer, who is going to give us a very important presentation. So I'm going to just to check how's things with you, Rachel. Check your microphone's working well, wonderfully. Uh, I'm good. How's that? Superb. Absolutely brilliant. Right. Here we go. Slides are up. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel. Uh, I joined Council as an ordinary member. And for the past two years, I've been the diversity officer on Council. Uh, I'd first like to start with a huge thanks to members of the diversity group and uh, everyone else on Council who've provided an enormous amount of support over the past couple of years. Uh, today, I'll very briefly present uh, a bit about what we've been working on. Uh, so as a UK-based charity, uh, we have a legal obligation to uphold the UK Equality Act. Uh, but for many of us, we'd like to go much further beyond this in making paleontology a more diverse and inclusive community. Uh, in 2017, uh, Council commissioned an independent assessment uh, of diversity within our community. And among the aims were to identify underrepresented groups as well as bar barriers to inclusion. Uh, some of the immediate actions from this were the creation of the roles of the diversity officer and the diversity group on council. And it's our responsibility to implement the recommendations made in the diversity study. And the creation of these roles means that diversity and inclusion are on the table at every council meeting and will continue to be. One of our first uh, major steps has been to implement ongoing data monitoring so that we can benchmark our progress over time. Today, I want to give a brief overview of where we are, uh, highlighting some of our particularly problematic areas. And I'd just like to, uh, I'd like you to bear in mind that um, not everyone fills out our diversity surveys. So before I show you the data. Uh, firstly, this is a snapshot of the employment status among our members. Here, I wanted to highlight that the majority of our members um, don't have, or nearly the majority of our members, don't have a permanent contract in paleontology. And it's um, the responsibility of those who do to support these members of our um, community. Uh, next, I will um, show you the proportion of our UK versus non-UK based members. Uh, obviously, not all of our UK-based members are from the UK. 50% uh, of our members are not from the UK, uh, thinking, uh, thinking globally. Uh, they come from 34 countries uh, and together speak more than 40 languages. Uh, but historically, we haven't been very uh, representative of this diversity on Council. And we'd like your input in uh, increasing this diversity. So please uh, consider standing for positions on council as they become available. Uh, next, I'm showing uh, data for gender. Uh, on the top right here, the baseline benchmarking data that we use in this context comes from uh, the UK census data. Uh, 
Uh, I'm also showing data for our members uh, council and uh, across all of our recipients, um, all of the recipients of our major awards. Um, women remain underrepresented among paleontologists. And we also know that women and non-binary people are underrepresented among uh, those who have permanent positions. Um, perhaps um, we're doing worse though when it comes to representing, well, we are doing worse when it comes to representing uh, race and ethnicity. Um, again, here we're using on the top uh, the top right, uh, UK census data as a benchmark. Um, and although ideally we want to become more globally representative, uh, in this context, the UK census data would represent the best case scenario, um, which we are not achieving. Uh, so non-black people of color are relatively well represented among our members compared to UK census data. But again, this is not reflective of our global community. And we know that these individuals are also underrepresented uh, among those who have permanent positions. And we are doing especially badly when it comes to the representation of black paleontologists. Less than 1% of our members are black. And to our knowledge, up to this year, we've never had either a black council member or a black recipient of any of our major awards. Um, earlier this year, in producing a statement in support for Black Lives Matter and in reflecting on the additional challenges uh, that black people face in their daily and working lives, we had to acknowledge the fact that we have not been proactive in supporting racial and ethnic diversity within paleontology and have never been explicit in our support for black paleontologies, sorry, black paleontologists. And we have to ask ourselves, like, why are there not more black members of our community? Um, we are grateful to um, Rob Theodore for support in producing this statement and Rob will be joining Council next year and has a number of thoughtful initiatives for our society. Um, next I will move on to talking about some of the initiatives that we have implemented, um, starting with mentoring which is um, uh, an evidence-based approach to increasing the representation of underrepresented groups over the long term. Uh, the scheme was initially introduced for postdocs and has received uh, positive feedback so far. And this year we expanded this scheme to also include um, PhD students who be can become mentees. Uh, mentoring is um, a tremendously rewarding um, way of contributing to the community. So I encourage you to sign up as a mentor or a mentee. You don't have to be a member of an underrepresented group to sign up um, and participate, uh, but please encourage those who are. Uh, we've done uh, quite a lot of work in terms of reviewing our awards and grant schemes. Um, in terms of implementation, perhaps most importantly, we've implemented a prioritisation scheme based on self-declared protected characteristics. Uh, under UK law, we can apply uh, positive action to support individuals from underrepresented groups. Uh, our prioritisation scheme is based on uh, data from the UK geoscience student population. Uh, the list includes students with disabilities, women, individuals from racial and ethnic minorities, and top of our priority list are black students who belong to the most underrepresented group within the geosciences. Uh, also, all first-time URB applicants, including students and supervisors, are eligible for one-year free membership. Uh, so I want to um, encourage you to um, nominate your colleagues for grants and awards. And I'd especially like you to think globally and beyond your immediate, immediate circles of acquaintances and collaborators. And of course, support your students from underrepresented groups. Uh, in thinking about our meetings, uh, this year we produced a report based on a survey um, of past Palace events. Uh, we had 325 responses, and this included more than 50 reports of direct experiences of harassment and discrimination. And this included sexual harassment, uh, transphobia, and racism. And several respondents explained that they didn't report these incidents at the time uh, for fear of retributions um, or um, these reports having a negative impact on their career. And um, so in response, we've um, uh, improved our mechanism for reporting code of conduct violations and we always encourage you to report uh, these incidents. 
Um, if you're organizing event, an event, you can check out these online guides uh, that were produced for organizing inclusive in-person and uh, virtual meetings uh, written by our Propel organizers over the past couple of years. These are available in our newsletter, but I'll also make a version of my talk available afterwards that will contain direct links to these. Uh, one of the areas in which I think we've been most successful is improving uh, the diversity of um, perspectives represented in our newsletter. And Graham Lloyd, our newsletter editor, has worked hard to increase um, the perspectives and issues that are published in here. Uh, we're grateful to uh, many contributors, including those who shared their um, very personal experiences. Um, I've highlighted a few uh, recent contributions here by Orla Catherine and Farid, which I really recommend that you check out. And again, I'll link directly to these um, later. Um, and of course, we always welcome uh, suggestions for the newsletter. Um, just quickly, um, finally, something else you can do if you want to get involved with diversity and inclusion work is to reach out to Emma Dunn and uh, Nuseba Raja, uh, who met after um, uh, writing an article on language diversity for the newsletter and went on to establish a number of quantitative and evidence-based projects um, uh, aimed at decolonizing paleontology and they're looking for volunteers so I really uh, strongly encourage you to reach out to them and get in touch. Uh, here are some of our future initiatives planned for 2021 and I wanted just to emphasize that um, as of next year we plan to roll out um, uh, one year free membership from, for individuals from underrepresented groups and developing countries. Uh, next up, I want to introduce our um, new diversity officer, Farid. Uh, he's from uh, Lebanon. He has experience working in paleontology in Lebanon, France, Switzerland, UK, China, Morocco, and the Czech Republic. Uh, he's based in uh, the. He's based currently at the Yunnan University in China. Uh, he's an expert on taphonomy and exceptional presentation, uh, preservation. He's fluent in English, Arabic and uh, French, and you can get in touch with him in all of those languages. Uh, here are some final suggestions for you. Um, please fill out our diversity uh, surveys and feedback um, questionnaires. They provide extremely valuable information and data for us. Um, also submit uh, your ideas to us, uh, stand for council positions. Uh, we're always learning. Uh, I'm always learning and we really benefit from your input. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think there were a few questions, but I think you've actually ended up answering those um, as you've uh, continued with your talk. So I think we'll move to the, uh, the next presentation, but I would say there's a huge amount of um, support in the chat for both you and the work you've been doing. So thank you for your you. Um, service to the association. There's a lot, a lot of positivity in the in, in the chat there. So thank you very much. But if there there were a few questions, I think you've addressed them, but maybe Rachel might add a little bit more. And there's a link from Fiona about some of the work onto the website if people want to uh, find out more. Thank you very much uh, to Rachel. At that point, we are going to uh, jump north to uh, we're going to see, we're going to prog pal first. Excellent. I'm just making sure I get the right. No, we'll do, um, we'll do Palace 2021 first. So, Rob, are you there? Hi, Jack. Sorry for the confusion there. Just making That's sure right. I was sticking to the agenda. And um, there's your slides. Uh, Rob Sansom from Manchester University. Take it away. Thanks, Jack. I uh, just want to echo uh, the thoughts coming through on the chat and from Jack there about Rachel's excellent work over the last few years working for the association to improve that situation. So um, I've invited to uh, talk to you a little bit about the next uh, annual meeting of the Paleontological Association. I don't know if I'm breaking some sort of record for giving the same talk two years in a row, but that, even asking that question could be a bit controversial. At the end of the Paleontological Association meeting uh, in Valencia, which now feels like a lifetime away, we were all having an excellent time, and this very day, I was hoping to welcome you to the University of Manchester's in-person paleontological association annual meeting. Unfortunately, of course, 2020 had other plans, and there has been rather large amounts of disruption. Indeed, we would have been welcoming a new and opening our doors today. But we took the difficult decision back in May to uh, cancel the in-person meeting, which, of course, in retrospect, was exactly the right thing to do. Um, and in the meantime, 
we've been uh, extremely impressed by the the work of the Oxford University uh, Natural History Museum and Jack and his team in delivering a virtual in-person meeting. So well done to them. Thank you for that. I'm sure Charlie will want to say more about that later on. However, as part of the deliberations about what to do, the decision was made that we would hopefully welcome you back to Manchester for an in-person meeting in 2021. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. Of course, this is all shrouded in a large amount of uncertainty given public health concerns. But of course, we hope to do so, in, in, assuming that things are approaching some sort of different state of play by that point. So uh, the University of Manchester, sorry, Manchester is an, a very global focused city, well connected internationally, and we look forward to welcoming you there, an open and international city, Brexit or no Brexit. So we will welcome our, our visitors from around the world. Um, the university uh, also, also, hopefully, to the in-person in Christmas markets. We'll be sharing some beers. I mean, e even the prospect of that now seems so <laughs> alien and distant. But we very much hope to have you back for an in-person meeting and all the concomitant advantages that brings. So the University of Manchester is one of the UK's largest universities with a large active group of paleontologists, archaeologists, zoologists and geneticists uh, at the Interdisciplinary Centre for Ancient Life. We look forward to welcoming you to our modern lecture theatre uh, facilities and a wide range of social events to support um, an in-person meeting. Unfortunately, uh, our museum, which houses our fossil collections, may be undergoing a refurb and be out of order, but hopefully we can um, figure something out. Word of warning, I think I hear my children just returning home from school, so <laughs> hopefully there won't be any interruptions. Um, to follow on from something Rachel was just talking about, Rachel has uh, organised a meeting feedback form, which has been invaluable in helping us understand the experiences of people. Uh, what we would like to know is what aspects of the virtual meeting that have been innovated this year you would like to see rolled forward to an in-person meeting. We're not entirely sure we'll be able to guarantee any of that, but obviously we want your feedback to know what you think would work well or the innovations that you would like to see carried forward for the future. So do look out for instructions for that via email in the future to all the attendees of the virtual meeting. We hope to roll forward our symposium, The Problem with Problematica, Pushing the Limits of Homology in the Fossil Record. Our invited speakers are hopefully going to be able to return uh, in person. Uh, but indeed, we may be looking at some sort of hybrid event and um, hopefully we'll help see those same speakers one way or another. And again, what seems like a complete anathema of an actual situation right now is an in-person field trip to the Jurassic Whitby with Phil Mayer. So uh, thank you, everybody, for your attention. And I just remains to warmly welcome you to Manchester in 2021 for an in-person meeting. And finally, uh, using my undeserved platform to say go you proofs for the paleo vision song contest happening later this evening jack over to you oh as the resident yon ola sand i'm not sure i can stand for using platforms <laughs> to uh to Sorry. support your entry like that <laughs> Right. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a great excitement for joining you all in Manchester. Um, uh, in the chop houses of Manchester next year. So we're very much looking forward to that. And without further ado, we are going to zoom across to find a little more about ProgPal. So there's the slides. And just to check, is your microphone working? Yep. Hello. Brilliant. Take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to start this by saying a big thanks to everyone who's been involved in this year's meeting. Um, I've really enjoyed attending it from sunny Ipswich. So that's been, yeah, a real treat. Um, I'm glad it could go ahead in some kind of form. Um, also just here to say thank you, a huge thank you to those who organized um, ProgPal uh, this year, to Bethany Allen and all her team, because I know to change that around and to use the virtual format so quickly is, is no small feat. So thank you for that. And um, we're really excited to bring ProgPal to you from London and University College. Um, we think the facts are right. It's been 34 years since ProgPal has, has been in London. So we're really excited to uh, get it this year. Um, we're looking at the dates of the 17th and 19th of June, which is pretty much, I think, six months to the day. Um, so if you're not familiar with uh, progressive paleontology, it's a student run conference for students. So any um, postgrad students, PhDs, masters, 
And also, if you're in your final year of your undergrad and you're looking to go into paleontology, um, then it's something for you to definitely consider. Um, all aspects of paleontology, and it's a really fun environment, I think, really friendly, really welcoming, and a good place to get to kind of meet your potential future uh, colleagues. Um, so originally we were planning to hold the uh, conference on our Bloomsbury campus. Um, it's pretty much in central London. Um, obviously we've got six months to go. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with the COVID situation. So potentially we will be moving the conference online and we're looking to make our decision um, at some point, I'd say early next year. So probably in January time, we're going to um, give our final decision so that we can really plan to make the conference the best it can be, um, whatever the format. So this is just a little bit about what we have planned. The first day, um, we plan to have three workshops for um, everyone to attend um, by Dr. Laura Porro, Dr. Phil Mannion, and Dr. Sebastian Crow on biomechanics, the paleobiology database, and paleobiogeographical methods. And we also, as a new initiative this year, we want to introduce some roundtable discussions. Um, so these can be on things like careers in paleontology, um, how to apply for grants, funding, and things like uh, mental health in academia. Then on the second day, um, it's the big day of talks and posters, and hopefully some sort of, of social event in the evening, but that's in person, online. We're not quite sure what format that will take. And then on day three, um, initially we had planned a nice trip to go to Crystal Palace to look at the dinosaurs and also a tour around the Grant Museum, which is one of UCL's uh, museums. Um, again, this may not happen in person, but um, hopefully we can sort of move that online if we need to and do another virtual field trip or get some interesting talks from all the people involved. So I'm just going to end here. So this is where you can contact us. We've now got our Twitter account up and running. Um, so if you are a student or no students or teach students, whatever, please like, tell them about this conference because it's, it's one of my favorite events to attend every year. And we'd really like to get the word out and get as many people involved as possible. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I would encourage all of our younger members to be going along to ProgPAL, a great continuing institution of the association that you should all get involved with and support next year's organisers. So thank you very much to our ProgPAL organisers of 2021. And with that, we are going to jump across to Dublin to hear from the president. How are you all? Um, those of you who were at the awards ceremony yesterday know that uh, Maggie Wood had some technical problems during her acceptance speech for the Mary Anning Award. And she very kindly recorded the speech again for us last night so that we could hear it. So we're going to start off wrapping up the conference by just taking a minute to listen to Maggie's acceptance speech. Thank you for those kind words. I'm really overwhelmed and absolutely delighted to be the recipient of this award. And I know that Stan would have been equally thrilled. I'd like to thank all the many people who've helped, guided and befriended me over the last few years. Their support has meant so much to me since Stan's death. To the members of the Tweed Project who included me in their team, to the staff at the National Museums of Scotland, who took me on as a volunteer and made working there so enjoyable. To Bethen in Edinburgh and Sarah in Cambridge, who taught me all I know about fossil preparation. And to my dear friends, Matt Dale of Mr Woods Fossils and Simon and Jackie Cohen of Fossils in Bristol. Thank you, thank you all for your friendship and support. And I want to pay tribute to the late Jenny Clack because it was she who suggested that I might have an aptitude for fossil preparation um, and really led me into this uh, new world. Very special thanks to my good friend Tim Smithson who has been such a support to me and to Stan over many years. 
Becoming involved with paleontology has been a privilege and a great joy over the past few years and it is an honour to accept this award. Thank you everybody who's made it possible. So, thank you again, Maggie. So, Charlie um, thanked all the outgoing members from Council yesterday, uh, but we thought it would be a good time to look forward and after the elections yesterday and all the results from those, put up a summary of all those who are joining Council from uh, 2021 onwards. And that's them there. And we owe them all um, a huge thanks for giving of their time to support the association. And I'd also like to thank um, our sponsors for this meeting, and they're sitting there behind me uh, now. Okay, closing remarks. Uh, to bring the 2020 meeting to a close, I'd like to start by thanking all those who have presented and contributed via both the standard talks, the flash talks, and the posters, plus the contributors to the paleoethics discussion, the annual symposium, symposium and Professor Rachel Wood for the annual address. And arising as is customary from the oral and poster contributions, we have some prizes to award, and we've changed how we're going to do that, and we're going to award three or four prizes in each category for when there's the event of a, a tie. So we'll start with the annual meeting council poster prize. And the poster panel has decided there should be four prizes and they should go to the following individuals. Bethany Allen, the impact of the Permian and Triassic biotic crises on spatial patterns of origination and extinction in brachiopods and bivalves. Susanna Gutara Diaz, the locomotory ecomorphology and evolution of body plants in Mesozoic marine reptiles. Polly Spruce, deep fried calamari, the effect of early Triassic global warming on cephalopod biogeography. Laura Austin Sides, a 2D geometric morphometric analysis of Plesiosaur flippers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moving on to the annual meeting president's prize, and this is for the talks that are in the 15 minute slot. There were three awards made, and they went to Alison Cribb, Growing Pains of the Agronomic Revolution, Ediacarian Cambrian Bioturbators Stimulated Sulfide Production in shallow sediment tiers. Susanna Gutara Diaz using computer flow simulations to explore the hydrodynamics of extreme body morphology and size in derived Mesozoic marine reptiles. And Alexandros Zaphos, the ever Zaphos, the ever browsing Dinotheridia mammalia proboscidea, uh, did climate change affect conservative herbivory during the Miocene? And I think I got about six of the words in that wrong. Um, finally, we have the Council Flash Talk Prize. And the judges again here found it impossible to separate two of the posters, uh, so we have four awardees. Emma Dunn, Scientometric Trends in Burmese Amber Research. Ewan Furness, using evolutionary simulation to improve biodiversity area models. Candela Blanco Moreno, Heterophilus ferns from Las Hoyas and El Montsec. Jane Reeves, intrinsic or extrinsic, untangling the impact of taphonomic, phylogenetic, and ontogenetic factors on morphological variants in exceptionally preserved fossils. So, our congratulations to those individuals, all of whom receive a year's membership of the association by way of a prize, um, but also. Our sincere thanks again to all who contributed presentations over the past few days. Uh, the standard was exceptionally high, both poster and talk, and you rose magnificently to the challenge of the new format and the new way of doing things. And that was an incredibly important part of making the meeting the huge success it was. And I'd also like to thank those members of council who judged on each of those three categories. So finally then, uh, some thanks to our hosts, not just on behalf of Council, but I think on behalf of all of us as delegates who've attended this conference. 
I'd like to thank the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, its director, Paul Smith, and its staff for being our hosts for Palace 2020. The decision to run Palace 2020 was not taken lightly. Um, anyone who's helped organize a Palace conference knows what is involved, and that is when you're using a tried and tested formula. Uh, this time there was an extra and a huge challenge. So the Oxford team organized, marshaled, cajoled and led superbly by Jack have risen magnificently to that challenge on behalf of the association. And you can see their names on the screen behind me. They've organized at pretty short notice the delivery at distance of three days of talks, a symposium, workshops, fringe and breakout events, an annual address, all as part of this uh, meeting. And it's been a huge experiment, but it's also been a huge success. And those individuals on the screen that you see there are in large part why. I was at some of the Palace Council meetings that Jack attended to report on how preparations for the annual meeting were going. And one of the features of those discussions was council members saying to Jack, Jack, would it be possible? Or things like, uh, Jack, what if we did this followed by then whatever suggestion that um, we had come up with? And invariably, Jack's unflappable response was along the lines of, not a problem at all, or I don't see why not. And those are actual quotes that he would routinely use. And it did get me thinking um, that it would be interesting to actually see what did cause him to lose his unflappable, calm manner. Jack, can you come back on screen and just sit beside me a second? There you go. We have um, a couple of small gifts to thank you and Duncan should now just emerge from out of the shadows and do the honours for us, please. Duncan, would you? Next talk, hopefully <laughs> one that you're not having to host. So there you go. Thank you very and much. A few extra museum branded goodies to go with the uh, go with the pairing. Thank you very, very, very much. Oh, thank you, Jack. It, really, really appreciated, and thank you for your very, very, very kind words. No, not Cheers. Cheers. And thank you to. So much to everyone who's who's been a part of this. We really couldn't do it without the the wider team, and especially the chairs who have done such sterling work uh, over the past few days. Yeah. So Jack, as he's mentioned, and as he's acknowledged, and as the screen um, shows behind there, Jack had great support, and we'd add to that the Palace Executive Officer Joe Hellowell, who also deserves our thanks. So from all of us to all of you at the OUM and Oxford Earth Sciences who were involved, a huge thank you. Um, we hope, of course, that having been forced into organising this meeting, as we have, it's a one-off. And there are, however, many elements that will take away from this <clears throat> for future meetings and events. I think it's a new way of doing things that we'll need to incorporate and use the best bits of. So the last job at the annual meeting is, of course, to wish everyone a safe trip back home from the meeting. And in my case, and possibly for many of you, that's about three feet to the sofa under that window behind me there where I'm heading for tonight. Um, for many of you making longer trips um, over the coming weeks, safe home, and I hope all goes well. And I'll also wish you all a healthy and a happy time over the holidays with a break and a chance to recharge ready for 2021. I'll wish you all the best for 2021, which will see us uh, gather together again, hopefully in person, but if not virtually for both London, for Prague Pal, and then for Manchester, for Palace 2021. Uh, thank you all for all you've done to make this meeting a success. It's very much appreciated. Thank you once more to uh, Paddy. There's one thing I have uh, forgotten to say, and I have just put it up in the chat, which is if you want a little physical memento of this digital occasion, you can buy your very own printed copy of the abstract volume, because I'm sure there are many members who have a whole stash going back decades, and you wouldn't want 
your 2021 to be missing just because it was a virtual meeting. So if you go onto the association website using the link that is now up in the chat, you can buy your copy today. There is a discount for members of the palace. And just to say, um, if you get your order in now, today, the order will get in before Christmas because the shop will close tonight digitally and will reopen in the new year, but you can also get it then. So I'll leave that link up in the chat. And just finally to say, it's been an absolute pleasure to host this meeting with the wonderful team here. We uh, very much look forward to welcoming you uh, physically to the museum, whether you want to come and work on our collections, bring your friends and family to see the exhibits, or just to say hello to the wonderful research group here. It's been an absolute pleasure to see you and we very much look forward to meeting in person in 2021 and with that the formal part of palace ends but we hope to see you in just over two hours at 7 30 p.m gmt for the paleo vision fossil contest where eight teams will be fighting it out to put their vision forward for who should be the winning fossil, your favorite fossil. So please do join us. The link for that is in your delegate pack. Without further ado, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all in person next year in Manchester. <laughs>